everybody. This is Michael Lucy, and he helped Rob's team out with our Trust Hub stuff back actually a year, a little over a year ago, maybe 18 months ago now. And I wanted to bring him on because there's been a lot, you know, a, a bit of a resurgence of anxiety about compliance and people just wanting to make sure that they're doing the right thing. And we want to make sure that we're helping you guys. So from Rob's perspective, from our team's perspective, we have been running DR and helping coach agencies, over a thousand agencies now on running database reactivation and SMS lead nurturing and appointment setting for quite a few years now. And we have a, some guidelines that we've always followed that so far we've never gotten in any kind of compliance trouble for. So we already come into this game with a high degree of confidence in terms of knowing how to make sure that we never get in trouble. We've seen some posts in high level about people getting suspended or different compliance issues, this and that. And we know how we've always been able to avoid any of that business happening. But there is a difference between just being able to fly under the radar and being able to have confidence in actually positioning yourself as a compliance expert. And that's where I think Michael Lucy has really set himself apart he is a business owner like us who helps folks with their SMS, just like us, but he has <clears throat> successfully educated himself to be able to position himself as a compliance expert, which is something that a lot of people don't think about. I know a lot of you guys in the group do not necessarily have such a high degree of confidence in your own ability to navigate these issues as to be able to get on a sales call and actually be positioning yourself to your clients as a, as a compliance expert. So that's what we're, the goal of this call is to fix that. And I want to take it in two parts. The first part is we have our own compliance cheat sheet that I've always followed the rules that Rob has had me always follow. And I want us to go through that together. And Michael, we can take a look at that. And actually, you're invited to totally shred it apart um, based on what you know about stuff. So we can actually learn something about the compliance itself. Because, you know, and just fair warning, guys, Michael's not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. But we are positioned as compliance experts. And at the end of the day, you know, this stuff is always growing and developing and it changes every month, it seems. And Twilio makes different statements about what's going to happen here and then it doesn't happen or then half of it happens or whatever. And laws will continue to change. And the point of this community isn't necessarily that, you know, this is ironclad for all time. Two months from now, we need might need to update this compliance cheat sheet. But we have it and we're following it now. And I wanted Michael to take a look at it to maybe either affirm it or refine it or whatever. And then at the end of this call, we'll share it with you guys in the hopes that we can all kind of be on the same page about this. And then in the future, we can continue to work together as a community using this community that Rob's put together to make sure that we're all kind of staying at the, at the front of the line with compliance stuff so that if anybody, any one of us runs into any kind of a problem in the future, we can all learn from that and edify and help that person fix it. And then, you know, maybe update our compliance standards in the future, that sort of thing. So that's the goal of the compliance cheat sheet. I'd love to go through it with Michael and have him shred it apart. And then two, I want to have you, Michael, talk just for a little bit about how you position yourself as a compliance expert when you're onboarding clients or as you're prospecting and doing sales, et cetera. That's the good part. Yeah, that'll be super fun. That'll probably be the most value of the whole call. Um, and then lastly, if there's any lingering questions, we can do a quick Q&A, but we've only got him until... 9 30 so if that sounds good to you michael and we can just I, I can go over a little while a little while okay the goal is to finish in 30 minutes like <laughs> we specifically talked about the longer you go on the more people fall asleep or but we're, we're going to try and finish in 30 minutes great okay so let's hit this hard really quick let's i'll share my screen and we'll just go over again this isn't you know well <laughs> i've already said too much i'll let's go over what Rob has Rob's team has put together for our compliance cheat sheet, which were the rules we always followed as an agency. Again, high degree of confidence in terms of knowing how to not get in trouble or fly under the radar, but still interested in, in Michael's input on that. So let me share my screen. And I'll just take us through this really quick. So these are our best practices for database reactivation compliance. And it's kind of broken into two parts. The first is what you actually put in your messages, how that works and how people opt in. And then the second is knowing what to do about this whole trust center thing and a brand registration, A2P registration, that sort of thing. So 
Disclaimer, we're not lawyers. This is legal advice. This is not legal advice. <laughs> but as agency operators, our team came up with this set of best practices in running database reactivation with SMS slash managing a database of leads with SMS for sustainable long-term success. And we did this without A2P business registration. That may be something that changes very soon. But here are our best practices for database reactivation compliance. First of all, if it's the first time you're contacting a lead with a new phone number, or if it's been at least 90 days since you've contacted the lead using that same phone number, the same channel, identify the business by name at the beginning. For example, this was taken right from one of our database reactivation templates, calling them by their name, that's good for results, and saying it's actually over at business name. So we want to correctly identify the business name. This is just logical. You want to do this anyways for generating good results, but it actually also is a matter of compliance. Uh, as far as I know, you're not allowed and it's not ethical to misrepresent the business or misidentify the business in any way. So that one's pretty straightforward. Next, if it's the first time you're contacting lead with a new phone number, if it's been 90 days, et cetera, same kind of clause here. Include explicit opt-out instructions at the very end. This is when you'll see stop to end or you know, uh, if you want to, if you want to get out, just press stop because our team always believes in human two-way lead nurturing. We always have a human on the other side who's managing these things. And we know how to have that human be trained specifically on opt-outs. So we actually include more human opt-out verbiage. Our opt-out verbiage we've used is, by the way, if you'd like us not to text you, just let me know because it does constitute explicit instructions on how to make sure you're never texted again by that number. And that's actually an advantage that we have of doing two-way live human interaction is we can have that manual action, which is high level makes super easy, just a click of a button with D&D. &D. So that's our verbiage there. For This is less for compliance, more for deliverability. We never send out links that redirect. We almost never send out links, period. If we can ever help it, we prefer to drive things conversationally for the sake of results. But with, when we do send out links, it's not bit.ly links or anything that redirects. And Michael- Even, Hammer, even ooh, internal yeah. trigger links will cause problems. I just myself had this problem last week where a message of mine wasn't delivered. And when I removed the trigger link, it worked just fine. So, so what I do in these cases is, mm -hmm. you know, you're welcome to do whatever you want, but I, in my, you know, my, my campaigns are different than yours, obviously, but my text message may say something or usually says something like, I also sent an email with more details, including a link. So I'll put the link in gotcha. the email and then refer back to the email in the SMS. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. We, yeah, with our conversational appointment booking style, we're 99% of the time, especially for fulfillment for local to see stuff. We, Rob's already encouraging our whole community. And so everyone in the, in the chat will know this. It's, it's almost never a good idea to even send out a link in the first place. We want to nurture, we don't want to send out the link to the booking calendar or anything like that. That's just stuff that will kill your results when you're going for appointments. So if you do ever need to send out a link for whatever reason, probably more on your prospecting side, your acquisition side of things, that's a great idea for sure. Um, but definitely like a bit.ly link or a short link that redirects, don't put that in a text message because you'll probably, it's, it's, it's a big, big risk for getting blocked or filtered by, uh, by third-party carrier stuff. Okay, next one, always notify new leads they will receive messages via SMS before they opt into your lead source. This is what we've always done and we've never had any issue with it, but I'm curious to hear what you say about this, Michael, both with our own stuff and with our clients in our forms, if we're running funnels for a client or if we have any kind of source that we know will get some lead nurturing via SMS. We put this at the bottom. Oops, whoa, whoa, whoa. Just trying to make sure. So our verbiage that Rob's always used is 100% secure. You'll get occasional messages via text and email, unsubscribe anytime. I've seen one or two things about people saying you need a checkbox in there. You need a more explicit opt-in. Do you know anything about that or what's your take on that, Michael? I, I include a checkbox myself. And then, you know, my verbiage is a little bit different. However, that being said, from past experience with myself and then other agencies I've helped, if ever there's a problem, if ever you have a problem where you're asked or challenged, you know, how, how did this person opt into your funnel? A picture like this, even though we're not lawyers, once again, a picture like this has always solved the problem. So if you can prove a picture, not only a picture, but a link to the actual page where they opt in, it has solved the problem. And, and whatever problem there was, Twilio and or the carriers or whoever we're dealing with, this has always been sufficient proof uh, to get beyond that problem. 
Yeah, so that did actually, that's exactly how it happened for Rob's team when we were going through our business registration, right? Afterwards, we got temporarily suspended for like kind of pending some things they asked us for some of the proof of how people are opting in, et cetera. And it worked the same way. I sent them in an example of a few leads who came in through a form like this. And then I think a link to the page with the form in it. And it had this verbiage in it and we were unsuspended within like a day or two. And, and and we haven't faced any problems since. So yeah, that's where we get that. That makes a ton of sense. Ultimately, I you know assume that it wouldn't hurt to have more robust opt-in stuff, especially a checkbox. But this is what we've always gotten away with for sure. So that's all of the things that you actually do with regards to the way you set your messages up, the way you have your forms set up to people in. And again, these sorts of things might change. And a month from now, it could be different. Laws are continuing to develop. Different cases are coming up that influence the way laws are interpreted, et cetera. It's just it's the way our legal system works. But we have a high degree of confidence in terms of this is what we've always done. And anybody running database reactivation in the style that we teach in our school community right now has never been in trouble for anything like this. And then this is a big one, which will kind of transition us. Our rule of thumb has always been, if you're sending out fewer than 500 message segments a day, skip it all, skip the trust center stuff until further notice. We've only ever known people to completely fly under the radar as long as they're sending under 500 segments a day. And I've never heard of anyone running into any kind of compliance issues unless they were sending out a couple thousand segments in a day in terms of their database reactivation or their follow-up or their blast or whatever. How about in the last week? Huh? Have you had any complaints or heard of any issues in the last week? No, not that I've seen, but I mean, I'm, have you? Yeah. 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 So yeah. this Even is a new for smaller volume actors. Yeah. Sorry? Even for smaller volume actors. Even for smaller volume actors. So can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. So that there was a deadline of January 26th when Twilio was communicating to us, agencies and businesses, that there's a new vetting process. And there were deadlines for things to happen. If you didn't do such things by January 26, you had to pay more money. It's a one big money grab. First, let's understand that. It's just a big right. money grab by the carriers. So post, and mind you, January 26, 2023 was like the sixth or seventh deadline that they right. bestowed upon us. So it's like the first five or six is they did nothing. So yeah, we're, we're trained. Wolf. I call it cry wolf. They've cried yeah. wolf five or six times. So now we're trained to ignore this stuff. Totally. And on January, roughly January 28th or 29th, and we, the people behind the scenes kind of measuring this stuff, we knew T-Mobile was going to be the first one to really start enforcing it. And sure enough, January 28th, they started, T-Mobile, they started routinely enforcing rules. And last week, I actually had a call with someone where their phone, their voice was shut down. And when we reviewed their logs, all undelivered calls were T-Mobile as well. Oh, um, and they're a lower, they are a lower volume actor. They're one, you know, an agency, but a bunch of small players, right? Small actors. And so what we did is we went through full compliance for both voice and text. And then there's a specific T-Mobile registration piece that's like an added layer of security in the T-Mobile world. And apparently AT&T has that as well. Uh, if need be, I can pull up the links for you later. However, the point yeah. being is I think we're we're at a point where they're going to start enforcing this. So this is going to, the until further notice is, this is that notice. It sounds like basically, yeah, we've gotten away with this for years, but we kind of knew it was coming. So let's talk about that then, because we've gone through brand registration and we want to make sure folks in our community are able to navigate that confidently as well. And luckily, high level with their LC phone system has done away with the need for new agencies to deal with Twilio directly. And they've actually integrated their entire trust hub into high level itself. And so if you have no idea what we're talking about, then just know there's a way for you to register your camp, what they call a campaign, basically register your phone number to make sure that you're a super legit, a legit business doing legit business practices using SMS in the right way. It's basically their way of making sure that they can minimize and eventually eradicate all the crazy spammy text message stuff that I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen. I get almost every day for political campaigns and 
you know, whatever I, else. I'm, I'm curious, like of the people attending, how many are using Lead Connector versus self-managed Twilio? Is there any way to measure that? Maybe oh, like, ask question. people to raise their yeah, we hand. Can do a poll. I'll do a poll really quick. I've never done a poll before, but that seems fun. Oh, whoa, what's going to happen? You can do it right on screen, I think. I thought I could too, but it's taken me to a link. Let's just set it up really quick. Okay. Twilio. These are bad, man. These are really cool. I include these in my, my sales demo. So I ask qualifying questions at the end and the end. The polls are badass. Point being is if you're not you if you're using Zoom webinar and not using polls, you start using polls. Let's go. Okay. Now how do I aha? Uh -huh. So do do folks see it? Well, the best thing to do right now is shut shut the screen share down so you can see your menu bar. Oh, thank you. Thank and now you. you'll see polls. You can launch the poll. Launch. There you go. Okay, we've just launched the poll. Oh, look at them go! Look at that! All right, so it looks like two two thirds, roughly two thirds on GHLLC. That's good. Cool. So if we can carve out just a few minutes of time on the tw because there are so many self-managed, I'd like to share my screen and then show a couple few helpful. Absolutely. Hands. Please do. That'd be great. And then we but can look at those C phones. Do you want me to do that then? I'll, yeah. I'll try to hit up both. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Folks, I'm just checking out the chat really quick. Trevor's question. Yes, you'll get a copy of this cheat sheet once it is beautified and updated based on literally the content of this call. So we're really looking behind the curtain here. I mean, we're not, Rob's not a lawyer. We're not lawyers. We just know what's worked for us. And Michael knows even better than us. So we came on here to learn too. And yeah, hopefully it's just a good example of all of us being lifelong learners. Here. All right. You may have already trained people on this, but your your compliance within Lead Connector is in settings. This is for you for agencies and your clients. So your clients now have the capability to do this. Yep. So anyone that is using Lead Connector, you can have instructions for your clients to fill out their own compliance pieces, which is you just have to make sure your instructions are crystal clear and that they complete the instructions and they clearly understand if they don't do it, they're at risk. Yep. The good news about Lead Connector is it's very simple. You you follow the process. The first pro you'll see the first step here is your business profile, and that's submit your name, your EIN, your business legal business information. And here's some really helpful hints. What they're looking at is they're trying to make sure you're a legit business and not some jerk off the street that started a business yesterday in their in mama's basement. So they want to make sure that your legal business name is on your website. Number one, when you submit your, your profile, make sure your legal business name is in the footer of your website. And number two, you have an email domain that matches your website. Everyone I know that submitted a Gmail or Yahoo or Hotmail, like it's an auto suspension, nearly an auto suspension. Interesting. Uh, rejection, sorry, wrong word, rejection. Yeah. So th those are some helpful things. If you follow those, you'll get approved 99.9% .9 of the time within 24 hours. In the High level lead connector space, you can't start this until this is accepted. That's kind of a, a bummer. This takes about a day. Once that's done, then you can go through A2P campaign registration right there. And, and as Haplin said, it's a multi step process. I'll show you that on the Twilio side when I'm done with lead connector. I also highly, highly, highly recommend doing Shake and Stir as well right now. So Shake and Stir is the A2P equivalent in the voice world. Last week, I had mentioned some lady, her calls stopped working. She simply submitted her shake and stir and she, they use a, what's called an attest, attestation rating, which is basically a credit rating in the voice and SMS world. So she had not previously registered shake and stir and she was getting C-level attestation. And apparently T-Mobile says, all right, anyone with C-level or worse filtered, we're not delivering the call. We're not delivering the SMS. As soon as this was submitted and approved within less than 24 hours, her, her attestation rating was A+. Plus. So then all of her calls started going through. So in the Twilio response or documentation, it'll say, here are, re here are reasons why your calls aren't going through. And it'll say low call, low call connection rates, low call times or smaller call times. Mm -hmm. And they'll give you a whole list. And you'll be like, well, my calls, 75% of the people I call pick up the phone. My calls are an average of two minutes. What's wrong with that? But then yet, once you realize that you have to have the compliance piece submitted, it, that takes care of everything. 
Right. So if you're yeah. making calls with go high level, if you're actually on the phone using the soft phone for whatever reason, that's what he's talking about with shake and stir. Yeah. And this costs you no money and 30 seconds worth of time. So right. if you're here and you're doing the SMS, you might as well do the voice, even if you're not doing the voice. It's better to have it and not yeah. use it than not have it and want to use it. Fair enough. Yep. This is coming soon. What CNAM is, is it when you call out, it puts your brand name in there. Yeah. So if anybody's had the experience of a lead saying, or will you call yourself to test and it says spam likely, if you've ever seen that in the caller ID or whatever it says on there, CNAM is how you fix that in terms of it'll say, Probably. Well, shake and stir will get rid of spam likely. Just put your oh, number okay. in. It'll put your number in there. Oh, okay, great. And then if you want it to say something different, yeah. that's what CNAM is. Cool. Yeah. So, you know, I understand high, high levels perspective that the CRM's perspective here is they want to get the pieces, the features, the components that we need to be compliant that are most important. And, you know, while this is nice to have, it, it's not important. These other three supersede the importance of this, but do pay attention to this becoming available when it is available. Once again, it costs you no money and 30 seconds worth of time. Just do it. Yeah, absolutely. Now the only, I, I just became familiar with lead connector last week. So I'm, I use self-managed Twilio. I manage many different Twilio accounts, right. not only my sub accounts, but other accounts. The problem thus far I've seen with lead connector is if there is a problem, you do not have access to the Twilio logs. Right. And I have a conversation with Sean right now about like, how can we get, at, like, if there is a problem, you need to see the logs. You'll need to see what's not being delivered, what's not working. That's just kind of basic and troubleshooting. So hopefully in the near future, there'll be some kind of way to view those logs. Because once you have the logs, you'll be, be able to better troubleshoot what's causing the problem and then solve it. Yep. So that's the only disadvantage of lead connector thus far. The advantage is out way outweigh that one small thing. I just, you know, I'm kind of cherry picking a little bit here, nitpicking. Yeah. The 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 ease of submission in lead connector is infinitely easier than the submission process in Twilio itself. So they got that, you know, be be aware of that. Very yeah. simple. Yeah. And it, the, I mean, the trust hub looks like it's almost the exact same thing. It just kind of saves you the step of having to go through all of Twilio and stuff, but show, take us a look, take us there and show us a look at, at how okay. that looks in case folks so are using Twilio. Exactly. How I nav this, the hardest part in Twilio is the question, where do I navigate to? How do I get to where <laughs> I'm going and what do I do? It's like impossible. It really, and it changes. It's horrible. It does change. <laughs> So I, what I do is regardless of what changes they make, I always use this up here account and I use, I click account and then I go to trust hub and I can never go wrong regardless of where they put it. It's, it's always going to be in that account feature up there. So if you're starting from scratch, I'll just go through the process. You can do a cost. You first you do just like in Kaplan's cheat sheet, the process is submit your business profile or what they call master business profile or secondary profile. Your master profile is for the agency. Customer profiles are for the sub account. Now, please, one thing to note here, I highly recommend running, even though I do it, I'm kind of being contradictory here, hypocritical. Don't <laughs> run Twilio out of your main account. Run it as a sub account. Okay. And the reason for that is, think about it. If your sub account gets suspended, all you're affecting or having impact on is that one sub account. So you get a rogue, get a rogue client that says they're going to, you know, abide by the rules and be compliant, but they're jokers and they start spamming everyone. Well, you don't want that person to affect any of your other clients and they're in their own little sub account. Everything's fine. They get suspended by Twilio. Everyone, everyone's unaffected. Right. Now, if by chance you're running your voice and SMS out of your main account, and that main account gets suspended, what happens? Now you affect everyone downstream. Right. So if you're going to run your own self-managed Twilio, create yourself a sub-account and then run your Twilio through that sub-account. Yep. So have sub-accounts for every different client and include your, treat yourself as a client. That's yeah. how Go High Level is kind of set up anyways. Yeah. You want to have a sub-account dedicated to your own acquisitional efforts anyway. So that should be another sub account Twilio if you're using Twilio. If you guys, if you're, so recently Go High Level started actually not even having people get on Twilio. They just automatically set you up with lead connectors. So anybody who's joined Go High Level in the last two or three months now, 
probably has never even heard of Twilio or dealt with this at all. And I just want to talk to those people for a second. If that's you and you're like, what even is Twilio? Am I missing out? Don't worry about it. Go High Level has taken the steps to obviate your the, the necessity of interacting with Twilio directly. And like Michael said, the, the good outweighs the bad. And it's only continuing to get better. They're developing more in terms of CNA, and I'm sure they'll continue to develop more in terms of helping agencies work directly from within Go High Level to deal with log stuff or suspension stuff if that comes up. And support's been pretty good so far about working. Yeah, with there's support. You got it. So support ticket connector, submit a support ticket. If you have a problem, they'll help you solve yeah. it. Two, two yeah, people have reached to me. Oh yeah. Okay. Let's, well, let's, let's, oh, Rob Bailey's in here and he raised his hand. Let's go ahead and make you a panelist, Rob. <laughs> but the point, the, the overall point is that high level is on our team and is working very hard to empower and support agencies in this effort. So we want to make sure we're leaning on them and, and taking advantage of that. I'm even going to make you a co-host, Rob, so you can mute and turn your video on if you'd like. So I'm going to piggyback off of what you just said. And this yeah. is off the record. Hopefully there's no high level people here. <laughs> the, they they deferred the, this compliance piece for about 18 months now. They started building this in summer of 2021. Yep. And they kept deferring it. And they kept deferring it because the cry wolf sy syndrome. There, there was, was no, no need to enforce no compliance because the carriers weren't enforcing compliance. Mind you. What's happened since summer of 2020, and there's a point I'm trying to make here. I'm not trying to put anyone down. It's a big money grab by the carriers, what it is. Like, we're only paying three-tenths of a penny, what I call tax. It's a fee, but I call it a tax. We, we may only be paying three-tenths of a penny tax to T-Mobile and two-tenths of a penny to AT&T and 30.3 to three-tenths to Verizon. They've been collecting that money for 18 months, and it adds up. And it may not affect us that much, but when you add 30% or more to a cost of a per unit tax, it's a lot of money. So carriers are getting theirs. Now, mind you, high level, I, I was involved in conversations at the beginning. So what, what's happened is high level is now leveraging, it's a leveraged group buy is all it is. So they have 20,000 plus agencies. They bring many of these agencies up under their umbrella. And instead of them spending 0.75 cents per tax per unit cost fee, is it may be 0.65 or 0.6. So they have a vested financial interest in this. And I bring this up because high levels objectives and our objectives are not necessarily aligned. Their, their objective is it's, it's now a profit center for them, but they're starting to understand the importance of having to deliver these compliance pieces. They drag their feet because they could. Mm -hmm. 18 months. So now we're at a point, it's go time. It literally is go time. So they're now reacting to this compliance. So when you submit a support ticket, I recommend, you know, creating a sense of urgency when you do submit that ticket. Not, I'm not saying they don't respond. I'm not saying their customer support is horrible. It's just understand their goals and objectives are a little different than ours. Sure. Certainly. Yeah. And one of the benefits of coming in as our affiliate and being a part of our community is that we can help you expedite tickets and we can help you manage the, the experience of dealing with support because we're very, we're very close with tech support over there and we've got our connections. So, and uh, here's, so here's one for the people for the, I, we took the poll. It was about 20 of the 45 people are using self-managed Twilio. In high-level lead connector, you have to go through the process step by step by step and wait for each prerequisite to be approved before you move on to the next. In self-managed Twilio, there's a kind of, there's a back door to be able to do everything in one fell swoop. So what used to take us days, because you do one piece and you'd wait and get back, you go back to attend to it the next day, do the next piece and wait, and then do the third piece and sometimes fourth piece. You can do it all in one foul swoop now by simply going to account view and then clicking this A2P messaging button here. And then once the screen opens, you'll see on the left, there's menu items on the left. So I'm gonna scroll down, there we go. You have the overview, the brands, the campaigns and the onboarding. You can do all, of, even if you're, even if you or a client's business profile is still in submission, you can go through this process and submit all these. So you can get it all done in one fell swoop. And in the last two weeks, I've helped considerable number of agencies with this. And with this back door, you can literally be done. If you have all your pieces of information on hand and you're ready to submit, you can be done in 10 to 15 minutes.
which is a lot better than it was 18 months ago. Yeah, certainly. I'll do the best I can to. Hey guys, I'll just jump in real fast while Michael is taking a breath here. Thank you for being here, by the way, Michael, and See dropping you. bombs. Appreciate it. The, the chat was turned off. I've asked my team to change this setting and lovely Zoom had, keeps resetting it back. To, so anyways, it was probably good just to focus at the beginning anyhow, but I went ahead and turned the webinar chat on. So y'all can go ahead and start asking questions and let us know if this is helpful. What Michael is talking about is helpful to you guys. Is this providing clarity? Because I know it's confusing. It's really hard to answer this stuff in Facebook comments or group comments. So give them a little bit of feedback, a little bit of love. If you're enjoying it, it's helpful. But it seems like, Michael, everybody on the planet <laughs> yeah. is confused about this. It Because of what you just described, The plat there's like sort of three entities involved that are not our clients as an agency owner, right? There's like high level, the carriers, and then Twilio. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, it's very easy to read one comment and think, well, what does that apply to high level, the carriers or Twilio or all three. And then also what's, what I find challenging is, is context, right? A lot of folks, they state a problem, but they don't give us the context of why it happened. And they think that this is happening to everyone. And it rarely is happening to everyone. So I think that that your, and I'm going to go to high level tomorrow. So whatever you guys want for me to tell Sean, Robin and Varun, I will straight up say to them because like, I don't have a problem just telling them the truth. We have a very healthy pushback relationship, if you want to call it that, but he looks to folks like us who are actually working the business to figure out what's most important to them. So certainly take this time to speak up, ask Michael questions, state your requests, including you, Michael, if you want for me to Go to bat for any of these items, well, and you're like, one thing I mentioned before you jumped on, and you yeah, put, write this down and, and bang it against the shun is the ability to access logs, SMS and voice logs. In the Twilio, I'll show you in Twilio, we have unfettered access. If you're self managed, you have unfettered access to your logs. And if ever there's a problem, having the logs is step one in troubleshooting. Why is there a problem? And without access to those logs and high level lead connector, if there is a problem, now you're relying upon submitting a ticket and working with high level and hoping they have someone that understands how to view the logs. I've actually, I've done that. This wasn't in Twilio directly, but I've actually sent two different attorneys, the logs and the proof because they were like, Hey, you guys are definitely, and I'm like, Nope, they signed a physical piece of paper, checked two boxes that said we could do it. And this is not a robo robocaller. Here's the logs and the you know, the history and the, the back and forth response. And they're like, yeah, we're good. <laughs> I was like, all right, bet. So, and I'm talking about like in a client environment, it was with two gyms. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think it's not an invalid request to want or to have that. It's for troubleshooting and proof purposes too, right? Yes. Yes. hundred percent. So there's a lot of questions in the Q&A, as well as now in the chat, since Rob opened that up about what exactly is all the information that's needed in order to get a brand registered or get a new campaign up and going. I wonder if you might take us through that really quick, Michael. So, you know what, I'm going to go, I, I can't, I've already submitted my profile. This was, this was kind of our, our core objective was to go through the process and we're going, I'm going to go through it on Twilio quickly. I don't think I have any sub accounts. I don't I don't have any sub accounts that I can go through the process so I'm, I'm yeah, gonna I've got one that I can pull answer up your question in words yeah. the the what's called master customer profile for your agency or for your sub account secondary business profile you're going to need your EIN and then your legal address those are required so if you have making sure that whatever address you registered your business as, you have that handy. Those are the two most critical pieces of information. Everything else is a drop down. What industry are you in? What sub industry? Gotcha. Then it's going to ask you for, you know, digital assets. What's your website? Have your website, have a website, number one. If you don't have one, just throw a landing page together and put your legal business name on the bottom. That's it. In the footer, I recommend. So it's across all your entire website. And then also have a domain specific email that matches your website. Those are the four things you need. And if you satisfy those four things, you're good. You're going to get approved. Great. That's for the original, what I, what we call master profile. 
once that's approved, I'm going to kind of circle back to where we were five minutes ago. Once your master profile is submitted, you can go to account overview and click A2P messaging. And this is the back door that allows you to do it all in one fell swoop and not have to wait for that business profile to be approved. You can do it all in one fell swoop here. So it, the, the three steps are, and I think this is in your cheat sheet, is you create a messaging service, number one. I'm sorry, a brand. Let me go back to where I was. Ugh. Don, I'll share the cheat sheet at the end of the call and then we'll post it with the replay in school. Okay. Account, overview, click A2P messaging. And then on the left, you get this regulatory compliance menu. Just follow mm -hmm. the instructions. You submit your brand right here. And when you submit your brand, I'm not gonna do it. I'm just gonna walk you, walk through the process and give you a couple helpful hints. The brand, okay leverages that customer profile you've just submitted. So in a dropdown, right. it's gonna see what, what customer profile do you wanna use for this brand? And you use the one that's in submission. Click this, here we go. So which, it's gonna use my, this brand. I've already registered this brand once. So if this had been your first time, there's a dropdown that says, what profile do you wanna use? Then, the next question is what kind of use case is this for text messaging? Unless you have a reason not to do so, always select low volume mix. Low volume mix is kind of like a catch all. Okay. It says I send a, a low volume of a mixed type of messages. That's essentially what, what we do. 99% of us, that's what we do. And then once you click that, you put in a description and, you know, try to make it as least marketing word wordies as possible. And, you know, I always put, I use it to confirm point. I use it for appointment confirmations, appointment reminders, and follow-up. And in the follow-up is everything else, right? And then I copy paste with tokens and everything directly into the sample messages. And this yep. is the same form you have in lead connector as well. I yep. always, I always check these just as a a safety. So once again, it's better to have it and not use it than not have it and want to use it. And, and I do agree with Haplin. Don't just don't send links unless you absolutely have to. And this is only if people opt in, like text Bob to 734-123-4567. So these are these are this one is not optional. These last two are optional. Gotcha. Okay. So once if we were to submit this right now, it would sit on the screen for maybe 15 to seconds to 60 seconds, and then it'd be instantly approved. Yep. So great. <laughs> the next part is assigning. So we created the brand, step two, create the messaging campaign, step three. And then the final step is adding phone numbers to the campaign. That's the last step. Yeah, just assigning the phone number to the campaign. And you do so by... Over here on the left, once it's approved, mm -hmm. you click campaigns and you then select add phone numbers. Yeah. And for for LC guys, this is all it, this is this is all embedded in a, in a help doc from Go High Level too. So these are just steps that you have to go through. We can definitely clarify this and support you with this as we move forward. But don't get too bogged down, especially if you're not familiar with Twilio as an interface already. Folks who are already familiar with Twilio, you've been on high level forever, so you're using Twilio directly. I'm sure this is very helpful too. If this is not, this is confusing to you, then just know that LC makes it even easier in terms yeah. of the interface and how to go through it, even if it does take an extra step or two. It makes it infinitely easier. Yeah, it really does. And and high level's there to walk you through it as well. So they have their own help docs. It's just a the, the very, very basic set of instructions. So I, I'll go through the, you said part part two was to kind of explain how to leverage this to your advantage. I'll just do that as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, I leverage the crap out of this. And I do so because I operate myself, our agency, we operate in the 501c3 NGO, non-governmental organization, government and political candidate space, of which fortunately, all of those are exempt from these compliance pieces. However, 
they have to go through the process to become exempt. So for 18 months, I've been waiting for this day because I know my competitors that aren't paying attention to compliance, there's going to come a day when their stuff stops working. And my message to my, my outbound prospecting and sales message has always been, you know, there's, there's compliance concerns you need to be aware of. Even though you're exempt, you have to go through the process. I specialize in that. And there's going to come a day when a lot of people that don't pay attention to it are just going to stop being able to have SMS and SMS delivered and voice calls sent out. I, from day one, am prepared for that. So I positioned this as a sales pitch for 18 months, and I've been waiting for this day because I know it's a huge opportunity for me and also a huge opportunity for you. And you can just make it, you know, a simple feature in your sales pitch to, to potential clients and say, look, we're also compliance experts. Unlike the guy down the road that you might be talking to about the same services, you know, he may not be or she may not be as up to speed on current compliance as we are. One of the things that we're going to make sure you have at your fingertips is from day one, your SMS, outbound SMS, and your phone calls are going to work 100% of the time. We, we make sure that happens. So you can spend the words however you want, but I think it's in, in a, a world where compliance has become more, will become more and more critical is positioning yourself as the go-to for that will be critical. You can even include that as a, as a qualifying question for new clients is, have you ever had a problem with a vendor not being able to send text messages or make phone calls on your behalf? If they say yes, you, you should be able to close this deal. 30 seconds. If they say yes, you know their pain point and you just, you, you just nail it. Hammer at home. Right. Um, so th that's that's how I position it. it. It works. I'll just leave it at that. It works. So, um, Michael, yep. what what is a good way for people to stay? Because this is the kind of thing that, to me, shouldn't stop anyone from doing business, right? I think if you're not a bad actor, which, uh, like, let's just say that you don't have everyone on this call and everyone who sees this video it doesn't have a bad bone in their body. They're not going to abuse this stuff. They're going to basically say, Rob, Happen, whatever you guys have been successful with for the past six, seven years, cool, go for it, right? We're not going to change it one bit. And, you know, but, but they want to stay that way, right? There's a difference between, because this is what happened with email. It's what happened with social, you know, this always happens, you know, and every time compliance comes down the road, I, I say the same thing you do, which is good because that means that like 99% of my competitors are just going to get caught sleeping and I'm going to stand out. Like, it's basically like a blue ocean opportunity for me. hundred percent. Yeah. Right. So how can someone stay, stay up to date? Let's say that, that, that they get everything they need to do to be on board with your, with your help today. Certainly. Thank you. And, and they're standing in the new blue ocean as an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. What, how do you recommend that they stay current on everything so that they can take as the most amount of advantage of, of that opportunity as possible? Does that make sense? Yeah. So those using lead connector, I would heavily rely upon high level and Rob and Hatlin to, you know, be the conduit of what's important and what's not important. For those of us that use self-managed Twilio is, you know, stay, pay attention to what goes on in the community by all means. And, you know, by all means, listen to what Sean and Rob and Haplin have to say, but you know, now you're responsible for a little bit more than, than you would be if you were using lead connector. So now you, you need, need to be a little bit more proactive. Now, Twilio is very good at keeping us informed. If you're a self-managed Twilio now, granted the message can be a little cryptic, and if you're not, if you don't understand the context, you might might be confused. You may have to read it four or five times just to get a clue as to what they're trying to communicate. So, you know, understand the bare bones minimum to start with. And this is what we went through today is pretty much the bare bones minimum. Yep. And then when changes are made, I'll say this, the changes are come not from Twilio, not from high level, not from a bio means, not from me or Rob or Atlin, is they come from the carriers or an overseeing regulatory body. Right. And as we've witnessed the last 18 months, it moves really slow. So I wouldn't worry about fast changing overnight things that will impact us. Just pay attention to what's on the radar in the, in the upcoming future. The last 18 months have proved this. Nothing moves fast in this space. Yeah, um, agree. So be aware of what's coming and then, you know, react to it quickly. Be be a, be an early adopter of it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've heard other people say, 
things like, oh, Twilio's, you know, it could be cheaper. You know, they're they're the ones changing all this. And it's that's not the case. No. Twilio goes to court, sometimes the Supreme Court, to fight these battles on our behalf, on the good actor's behalf. That's the way that I choose to look at it. It's not really like they're doing like they're doing it in their own self-interest first, <laughs> of course, but but that helps us, right? Like they go and win a court case and it's no, this is not a robo dialer, right? It's not the same as the the things that we're actually trying to do what's right by the consumer yeah. so that we, you know, the good people aren't penalized for just wanting to communicate the way that their customers and, and prospects want to be communi communicated with the most, right? And so they'll go do these huge court battles and then, you know, all these uh, clickbaity articles will take everything out of context and bring up like how Papa John's got sued once 16 years ago because they were just spamming the crap out of people and they couldn't have subscribed, mm -hmm. you know, people that had never heard of them at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, like these are two totally different things, but you're right. You kind of have to like be able to read it, digest it and understand the context of what they're saying and why. And that's kind of difficult. So I'm, I'm a fan of doing what you're describing and sort of like, crowdsourcing it from the handful of people that I trust who know, who like understand these things, right? I agree. I think high level is taking more and more of this off our shoulders. I, when, whenever I have spoken to Sean about it in particular, it's a, it's a big, it's like the 800 pound gorilla he's trying to tackle with this. Yeah. He's told me it's not easy at all. No. He's had an easier time like with Google, which is like surprising to me. I don't know why, but you know, tougher time getting like the chat integration done, got done, done with Google. Than he has with getting a lot of this lead connector and and sort of like voice features in the in the SMS features dashboard really to where he's look if you guys as long as you guys are doing what you're supposed to and this thing has the built in features to protect the consumer, then you guys will have very little to worry about compared to what else it's like out there. That's his goal with it. Like I know that's his goal. How fast he's been able to do that? That's a different story. And of course, you're correct. It has been 18 months, but I do think that still compared to the way that we used to do it like just four, five years ago, it's, this is like still way faster and easier, way, way better to scale. The cost is freaking nothing compared to how much it used to cost. Right. Uh, like pennies on the dollar, like our Scipio bill used to be 44 grand a month, no matter how, how little we used it. Right. Cause they would just charge per client. And then if you went over their usage fees, then that's you're paying more than that. Right. So that got replaced by a $300 a month plus Twilio fee. If you do the math on that, that's like over $40,000 a month of revenue that the agency owner would have kept. So us as the agency owner would have kept. That's like more profit than any month I had as an agency, except for maybe two, I think. And those were like mega sales months. <clears throat> like they were not sustainable. Right. Right. So when we're talking about the opportunity, is all this stuff worth it? Do we have questions? Is it something you sort of got to stay on top of? Yes, to all that. But it's worth it, guys. In my opinion, still, it's like a no-brainer, hands down, zero hedge. The best opportunity in the agency space still to, to run this in your agency because those are the people who win. Like when we were recommending clients sign up, even as affiliates, but like for ClickFunnels and Scipio and like other tools, all of that money, all that profit went to them, not us. And the client didn't need, even like necessarily like those tools, right? So to me, it's like anytime something like this comes in, you know, the, the big overarching one is like the chicken little comment. Oh my gosh, we should quit. The sky is falling. Everything's going to, oh my God. You know, it's just like all this one thing went wrong. Now our whole business is gone. It's like, no, like this is an opportunity. It's not, it's not a bad thing to have regulation. It's the same way I feel about crypto. I'm like, I want for regulation to come for crypto. Because right. that means it'll be safer and everyone can make more money. Right. Like literally, it's like, that's that's literally how I, I think about it. So so everything that you're talking about to me is music to my ears. I just want to make that clear to everybody because I know Renee says, geez, Rob, you're so damn positive. Because I've done this before, guys. Like when high level, do you guys know how, how I became the top grossing affiliate? It's because I was like, holy crap, this is an opportunity. And I jumped in the beta with Robin introduced me to Sean. I was like, I'm just putting all my chips on this tool because it was like in its infancy stage, it was way better than all the other tools we were using. Yeah. And I was like, I, I know I, Robin. I had a gentleman last week. Uh, what's that? 
I had a gentleman last week. We had, we signed up a new client in December, yeah. and they had their tech person over review our whole deployment. Yeah. And the guy we got on a call with them last week. He said, "Holy, shit, I have never seen anything like this." Right. It, it, like you have to realize, you know, we have a two hundred fifty million dollar mega beast behind us. Like this, just giant Goliath juggernaut of a company behind us, and we get to slap our logo on it. And go, yep, that's mine. So. <laughs> So I just want to cover the mindset part of it real fast too, because it's easy to get caught up in, should I go with LC or Twilio? Like da, da, da. To me, it's okay. I understand the question. Which one should I pick? Probably now moving forward, it's best to go with LC, right? Elite Connector. Right. So if you're not like already a Twilio nerd or you're not already set up on Twilio the way Michael ha has been and, and that's familiar and comfortable to you and changing would cause more friction than it's worth right now, then just stay where you are. But, you know... Halpin got on a phone with a buddy of mine, one of my, our first coaching clients ever, Evan from Medspell Advertising. He was like, dude, what do I do? You know? And I'm like, well, first of all, what you're doing now is not broken, right? So don't change unless you have to, unless you have some sort of exposed risk or you have a good reason to or whatever. But, you know, also like if you have the time and bandwidth and this does make your life easier pretty quickly then consider switching over to Elite Connector because the sooner you do that and, the, and the, the easier that it gets over time, that will probably, for everyone, it'll be like a hands-down no-brainer just to do, go with Elite Connector. That's my sense of it. I, I totally agree. We, unless yeah. you're, you fall into one of the obvious exceptions, the obvious exceptions is a political candidate. Uh, yep. There's separate vetting that needs to go on. You can't do that, as I understand it right now in Twilio. And a 501, which is exempt as well. There's separate processes for them. And by the way, 501c3s get credit from Twilio. So oh. of which you won't get if you use lead connector. So I'm talking probably less than 1% of all use cases, way less than 1%. So definitely lead connector. Now what you now you let the specialist take care of that for you. You don't worry about it. And you, when you deploy a new client, you say, here's a here's a tutorial video how to go through compliance. Do you want to do it or do you want us to help you do it for 50 bucks? Give them options. Say, here's a, you can do it yourself or we'll, we'll charge you 50 bucks to do it. Yeah. And I, everyone loves options. I guarantee a lot of, you know, say a hundred bucks, who cares? Whatever the number is, it is. I, probably, I'm going to guess 80% of the clients will say, you just do it for me. I, I don't yeah. got time. Oh yeah. yeah it's, but charge, I, make sure it's a, it's accounted for. Yeah. I would just, fold, the, the way that we roll, I'm like, we're just going to do it for you, man. You don't, if they go, well, what if I want to, okay, well, let me just show you everything. Michael, should, do you want to get, get into this and click all these buttons and sit around and wait and go back and forth? And, no. Okay, good. That's what I thought. Moving forward, <laughs> it's rolled in our pricing. We're just going to do it for you. So you can get the outcome that you hired us to get you, which is safely SMS your customers to get more booked appointments, reviews, et cetera, down the line. Right. So it's almost like you're, I, I think the positioning of this, you're right, Michael, should be something like, I'm your insurance policy for all the stuff that could go wrong that you obviously did not have before. Yeah. And so now that you got burned over there, I'm telling you that we are fully compliant and we are compliance experts here. And we're going to jump through all the hoops for you on your behalf so that you can safely move forward without waking up every day wondering if we're going to get popped for something even if we were doing everything right anyways, because sometimes that happens, Mr. Client, doesn't it? And they'll there's, go, there's, yeah. There's agencies that run call centers at a high level. And yeah. if your calls stop working, essentially your business stops working. Right. Text right. A text center is kind of like what you guys run. If your text yeah. stop or stop delivering, st are, are no longer delivering, your business is no longer delivering. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're dead in the water, right? So let's see. Let, let's go through a few questions. I, I got them up says, here from top to bottom. I have them staged here. Oh, yeah. Go. Go ahead. So if our agency is not registered yet for an LLC, we can't run a DBR for a client. I don't have a lien number. The client signs up with their own EIN. So every everyone is every message is accountable to a phone number. If you think backwards in the compliance chain, every message is accountable to a phone number. Every phone number is accountable to a brand. Every brand is accountable to a customer profile. That's the reverse chain of the submission. So you do not want to, in any way, shape, or form, take accountability or responsibility for anything a client does. Make them do their own compliance submission. That's first, can't emphasize that enough. That's most important. Second is, no, you, 
you don't have to have an LLC or an EIN. It's highly recommended, highly, highly, highly recommended that you do, but it's not a showstopper. It's just going to prevent you from, from now sending to T-Mobile, calling T-Mobile, and then moving forward is, you know, as Verizon and AT&T and Rogers and these other ones get on board, then it'll be more and more of a problem. So I, I, I indeed would recommend you get an LLC, but it's not required. Make each client sign up separately. Hope I answered that. For LC, do you have to go through the verification for every sub account or just the main agency? Once again, every client is responsible for their own voice and text. So yes, every client has to go through their own compliance. And you can do it for them as the agency, but it's going to be their business info that is on the hook for their activities, right? Next, does clients send out 100 per day for DR reactivation, I'm guessing? Yeah, database reactivation. No no notice of any problems with compliance. However, we send out a campaign of 50 texts, 10 minutes apart between 9 and 4. I scrolled past it. I'm trying to find that one myself. Up there. If we send out to a list of 3,000, we get slapped. Why? I'm going to guess here that low volume mixed, the fine print and low volume mixed is it's now 2,000, 2000 a day limit. So they'll ask, do you send more than 2,000 a day or not? If the answer is no, and you never do it, then you're low volume mixed. Gotcha. If you ever... I don't want to say ever, but if right now, the next six to 12 months, you forecast, you're never, never going to send more than 2000 a day. You're certainly low volume mix. If you potentially will send more than that, you have to recategorize your message campaign. That's a very likely reason why. Matter of fact, I'm, I like to use percentages, 99.999% certain that's why. That number used to be 3000, by the way, they changed it in the last year. Thank you, God. That's not a question. question here is, is B2B texting compliant with a clear opt-out message and introduction? I'm going to kind of expand upon what Rob said earlier a little bit. First thing I would recommend is you're laying in bed at night, you can't sleep, and you, you, A, you want to fall asleep, but B, you want to stuff your head with knowledge. A little bit of extra knowledge is be familiar with TCPA laws. So just do a Google search, TCPA laws. TCPA is federal governance, and every state has state governance. So there's superseding state over federal. Know your local laws. It doesn't mean study them, doesn't mean become a lawyer, but inevitably in a court of law is TCPA is what drives this. Like this A2P messaging stuff is all carrier driven. There's not one ounce of law built into this at all. It's just the carrier. Here's what happened. Regulators in DC said to the mobile carriers, look, you guys got to police yourself. A lot of people are complaining about spam. Either police yourself or we'll do it. Trust me, you don't want us to police you. The carrier said, okay opportunity to make money. So that's what they did. They created this program. There isn't a legal threat. There isn't a, an ounce of legality in it. It's the carriers doing what they think is best to police the environment for, for spammers. So that being said, text messaging is governed by TCPA. So be re, just read, read at night, get up to speed on that. Now, the thing I'll say is Rob was saying, not one of us has a bad bone in our body. Well, that's kind of subjective because we all occasionally break the rules. We all do. Let's not lie. There's people that operate in the white, 100% compliant. Those are very few. And there's people that operate in the black, which just don't give a crap about anyone else and just do whatever they want. They don't care about laws or regulations. They just do it. Those people got to go. And then there's people in the gray that are, are, are not intentionally doing something wrong but maybe doing something that's you know somewhere between the white and the black. Don't don't operate in the black. Operating in the black, I'll give you a couple examples that I have, I have been privy to over the years. Number one, very successful, one of the top mortgage people, probably the top mortgage producer in in Florida, has a brand name in the community, and they got some lady's name off. They bought it off a lead list. They called the lady, and she's oh. I'm on that she was on the DNC list. Even though they bought the lead from a third party source, the person making the call or sending the text is responsible. This lady sued successfully, sued this guy. And the only reason she sued is because he's a brand name and she knows he has money. So point being is the bigger you get, the bigger the target you are. And when you buy a third party lead list, you're at risk. Make sure you do everything humanly possible to vet that list. 
including such things as checking against DNC. Other targets are life insurance agents. I used to be one of those myself and I operate in a space. These, these guys are, just, they don't give a crap. They just want numbers and they want to call people and they'll worry about the consequence later. Well, I know a guy, he was on my team. He called someone in Minnesota from Michigan and lo and behold, he got, got a, a summons to go to court in Minnesota. Not only it's a $1,200 fine for the first time, automatic, you got to take a day off work, pay for the expense to fly to Minnesota, go to court, come back. So once again, an example of being a scrupulous actor. The 90 day limit, I would recommend everyone do a look when you're doing your TCPA homework at night, A, it serves two purposes, stuff your head full of knowledge and then read some boring crap that'll put you to sleep. Read up on the 90 day rule. The 90 day rule is very, very important. Very important. Yep. And these problems Michael's talking about guys, they're solved by uh, a lot of things that also will genuinely just affect your results. So we always believe in, a, in all cases possible, we want to be doing database reactivations to databases that have been created ethically with directly opting into the business. I mean, that's that's what's going to get you results in your business and for your client anyways. We don't really, I've, I've run campaigns and I've seen agencies run campaigns with sourced third-party lists and you know, not only are you at risk, they also just tend not to work. The business doesn't have a relationship with the client. That's really not what this whole two-way human connection we're trying to create with leads and doing a good, good job of representing our clients to their community of leads and engaging that community. All of this works holistically for the sake of building results as well as, as well as well as staying compliant. And so same thing with the 90 day rule. We don't believe in letting leads sit around in a database for more than 90 days anyway. So the first time we send DR to a, a warm list of leads, we have our opt out clause and we have all those compliance pieces. And then we believe in reactivating the list again within 90 days anyways, for the sake of keeping good touch points up anyway. So if you're following good practices from a results standpoint, that's also going to keep you following the best practices from a compliance standpoint. I have never heard of anyone getting in trouble with the court in a court of law on the B2B side. So, and this isn't a, this isn't a recommendation to spam businesses, but I've never heard of such a thing on the B2C side. You got to be super careful. Very, very careful. Yep. Um, and actually I've, I've seen a video, another one of our peers, <laughs> called the, the the offices of the regulators and said, are he specifically asked, are there any B2B laws or regulations that specifically apply to like text messaging businesses? And they said, no. So there's a very important distinction there that like, if you think about it, you just want to probably in that instance, have some sort of CYA, like cover your ass strategy anyhow, and say, go with what happened said, say, hey, I am Rob from Rob's business and I'm contacting you because I think you own this business. If that is incorrect, then let me know. So that first interaction is you saying, I, this is clearly a business outreach method, yeah. right? Something like that. That's what I would do if I was going to do that. I don't cold DM businesses, but I get cold DMs. And if they don't, if they don't say who they are, like their name and business, I'm like spam. Cause That's you know, right. it's usually all caps and they're misspelling. And it's, I'm promising you, you everything for nothing in return, stuff like that. I'm like, dude, this is crazy. I'm not responding to that person. But sometimes people write something actually intelligent and useful. And I'm like, that makes sense to me. Like somehow they got my number. They're reaching out for a business purpose. It's just like a cold email. I mean, HubSpot made a freaking fortune teaching people how to cold mail because B2B email is not spam. You know, they're a publicly traded company now. So that, you know, but they had to put some COIA things in there to make sure that it wasn't construed as such. Because if you are emailing some, you know, aunt granny at Gmail and her husband is shares the Gmail account with her and she's, this is spam. You know, I, I feel like I'm being spammed. They're always going to side with the consumer, right? So you just have to be like, well, that was a shared Gmail address and the husband owns the business. And I clearly said, if this, you know, and I never contacted her again. I said, great, I'll take you off my list or whatever the case may be self-unsubscribe, whatever the case may be. So, you know, you guys just have to like, you'll get used to this. It sounds like a lot, but if you just use the templates that we have in the compliance guide, that has all that stuff in it. So what happens is sometimes people try to be a cowboy and go off and they're like, I got this great idea. Screw what happened and Rob wrote in that template. And they remove something hella important like that without knowing why it's important. Does that make sense y'all? Yeah. So this is like a skill you got to build over time to 
to earn the right to keep doing this, basically, right? Right, Michael? The, the, the fuzzy part of what you just said is like in the B2B space is when you have someone opt in, they're likely, even if it even if it's the president of Ford Motor Company, they're going to opt in with their personal cell phone. So even though it's business, you got to be, you know, just be mindful of that. The fact that that person's voluntarily opting in and leaving their cell number is there's an ounce of trust built in already. And they're expecting something from you. So that person's not going to be a problem. It, it's it's the outbound messages and or calls to people that haven't opted in. And in a, in a B2B space, it, there's less, less risk. And Rob says there's no risk. Just be mindful of it. Yeah, yeah, of course. I, I, don't, I want to make this clear. The law says there's no risk, but how it gets construed is like that. That is the crapshoot part, y'all. So <laughs> th th does that make sense? Like, go, go do a Google search of type cpa in florida it's yeah. it's the first three pages are ambulance chasers oh my god it's crazy y'all and so <laughs> that that's where a bit of the common sense comes in so this is why it's hard to answer a question where it says if i'm texting this person b2b am i okay it's well according to the law yes depending on what you write might be the difference between you getting popped because you just text message one wrong person or not not trying to scare you guys. We've never had an issue. And we've done this a lot. Okay. But we've always been very mindful about the context. We don't try to win people back over if they are a clear D and D candidate or remove unsubscribe candidate. We're just like, peace out. You know, we, we always over communicate the premise of why we're doing it. Right. We always give them options if they are like, Hey, I need to call someone or what's, what's the business name again or whatever. It's like, you just have to do those things. Those things earn you the right to have that level of trust and to continue operating in the best channel that there is right now still. Like, that's super worth it, right? Something um, I so, just said earlier about, the, this is kind of off topic, but people complaining about Twilio and those in Lead Connector not, don't even know Twilio exists, is people may complain about the expense of a text message. And I saw someone in the community say, the cost of a text message is up 30% year over year. Why? Is there another provider or supplier of text message? Number one, Twilio buys from the cheapest wholesaler in the marketplace called Amazon. Twilio extends to us the exact same price if you were to go build your own app and, and hook up to AWS and write your own code. They charge Twilio the same street price as they would charge us. Twilio just gets huge volume discounts, number one. So I always say, don't go looking for greener pastures. I've spent... Save your time. There is no such thing as greener pastures. But also pay attention to these fees. These fees are like some questions I have for Sean, Rob, are for a markup on a text message, are they marking up the fees too? Or are they just marking up the per unit cost? As these fees start to get added, and I just looked at one of my text messages was 1.58 cents that like, two years ago was less than a cent. So 60% additional cost on a text message. Right. With these fees. Yeah. Now, I, I'd say we all need to be mindful of that as if and when we upcharge, use the LC upcharge on the, the text messaging. Yeah. And, you know, again, I think at low volume, you don't have to think about it as much because the benefit is just so great for the client, you know. But anytime you get into volume, right. And that's, you know, to give you guys an example, like we've never had a client where we're like, oh, shoot, we should consider that because you want to do so much volume. If you can't get your text messages good enough and relevant enough to where 200 a day, 250 a day is enough to keep their pipeline full, you need to go back to the messaging, not try to push more. That's <laughs> our opinion on it, right? And, you know, that just goes back to that whole thing. What is the purpose of us even doing this in the first place? Scroll the carriers and how it gets done, the pricing and all that for one second and say, our job is trying to get as many sales opportunities for these clients with people that already know, like, and trust them as possible, as efficiently as possible, as congruent with our sales process as possible. That usually ends up being the, the thing that moves the needle the most for us and for them so that they don't even care if we like, you know, upcharge a, f a few pennies here or there, whatever. Okay. But yes, you get into volume and it really starts to add up because the volume play is you're in a different value added reseller bucket if you're doing a ton of volume, right? It's so, so the way that we prefer to operate, and this is all in our training and ours happens, made a great setup guide. Like 
doing reactivations in under an hour for a, a low volume, you know, client. And, and like, literally we could just throw a rock and hit a person that we know we could help because no one is doing this. So, so when I, when people ask me about pricing and I'm happy to talk to Sean about it because it, it does matter and it will matter more in the future. But I think like Michael, you're probably a one percenter in that. And, you know, if you are in the nonprofit or political space, it matters a lot probably, but even big brands, like we worked with some big brands when we, when we had our fitness agency and they never questioned the price of the text beyond the fly ball numbers. And collectively they were doing quite a bit, right? right? But even if they went to shop, shop around, it wasn't like the result they were getting wasn't going to get them off of what we were doing because they could save a penny or two here and there over there. And I'm talking of not saving a whole lot at all, like right. maybe 10 bucks a month per location. It's like, that's nothing. You know, right. so and the friction of moving and the lack of results and everything. The other thing I see happening on that front is CRM. A lot of times, actually, the biggest objection that I've ever seen to this is like when we're working in the fitness franchise, for example, they have a chosen CRM that everybody has to use. So like mind body is a big one for whatever reason, you know, to me, I'm like, these are terrible tools, but whatever you guys are using it. They then they go, oh, it has text messaging. Oh, we get cheaper texts over here with mind body right in our crm and i go number one how many texts per month per day do you send and they go zero you know that's a really common answer and i go and they might say oh well, we send one blast out a month you know for it's basically like a broadcast email newsletter mentality hey we're open on fourth of july come on in you know it's not really driving any sort of pipeline activity or or, or meaningful business to the yeah. and so you know, that's the conversation where I go back to saying, okay, that tool does a specific thing, but we're, we're a lead management system. Our whole goal is to like fill your pipeline, get you a specific result and outcome. That thing is not getting it. So we're not telling you to replace it. We're just saying that our system does that better, right? To get you the thing that we want. And I promise you at the end of this, if we can't get you a hundred appointments by the end of the month, you know, then I'll pay you the difference in the text messaging fees, but we know we're going to get that for you. Right. And that usually just, they never think about it again after that. Like literally ever, like no one ever came back to us after that and said, hey, can we go back? Can you guys just do that in our CRM now? We never got that question, right? So yeah, I, the pricing stuff I get on one hand, but it's to me, it's more of a positioning and sales conversation than anything else for almost all of us, almost all the time. So if you are doing volume, might be something you got to study up on, take a look at, do your nightly reading, like you're saying, Michael. I don't know. I, you must be doing a lot for it to matter to you, man. I literally, it's, I haven't thought about it in years, actually. It's interesting that you brought that up because I, Robin was trying to get me into political campaigns at one point. He's, dude, the, like, if you just charge them for usage, like, that's your fee, like, double. I, like, I ran one stuff. campaign where I sent half a million ringless voice messages. Dude. Wow. Yeah. That's, then you have to pay attention to it, right? And I was like, I don't know, man, it's kind of like seasonal and seems like the swings are big and stuff. I was like, I don't know. But he he was a huge fan of it because he was like, it's so easy. What's that? They give you a file, you upload it, you press a button. And that's you, right. Yeah. Cash register. Just... Yeah. And you get your money and you move on. Like it's not results. It's like activity based. And so anyway, maybe that's an avenue we should talk about educating our community. I, and I didn't mean to take us into a rabbit hole. I did see in the community a few people, and there's always the few people that complain. A few people are complaining about the cost yeah. of the per unit fee going No, on. no, it, but it's not a rabbit hole thing to me because I see people complaining about the price and you ask how many messages they're sending. And it's not that it's, dude, what are you worrying about this for? And I think that's a common thing is, oh, I have to find the cheapest provider before I can get yeah. started and start helping people with this. And my answer is always no. Why is that? once you that's an actual problem once you're sending half a million a month ringless voicemails you know and, and, and even it's, when they do reach that point is the person on the other end you're having that conversation with they have to thoroughly understand that these new fees these new costs are fees and yes. i don't care if you're buying from wholesaler a or b or c or d every wholesaler has to charge these fees for the privilege to send messages to the mobile carrier totally yeah, it's, you know, paying title, title and tag when you buy a car. It's, yeah. Well, you know, okay, we're, you might be able to drive cross country and save a few bucks because of a state law is different over there, but you're going to pay the fee. We all have to charge you the fee. 
the manufacturer doesn't set that fee, right? We're just the one selling you the car. Right. So yeah, it's a, but I, I like that attitude towards it though, where you're educating them on how the system works, because that will also like when they go to someone and they're like, or they get hit up by someone else or they get drug or cross them or whatever, that's a differentiator that makes you stand out as an expert in this space, right? So the things that Michael is saying, it's good to be educated on because if you can intelligently talk about that stuff, then they go, oh, so I have to pay it anywhere. Okay, well, it's not really worth my time to keep shopping around then. I kind of like, I'm just going to go with him. Yeah, it, that happens a lot. It's closed deals for me before. Yeah, which we all have to get good at, guys. You know, if the first thing we say is, yeah, we're going to text message them. They're going to ask you something about it. At some point, right? All right, I, I didn't mean to get off track either, but that was actually a good one because- it, that question comes up all the time and it's vague and the context is missing and all that stuff. That's another one. That's like a sneaky one, right? It's like, we see that. Yeah, everyone walk away knowing you're using the best tools on the marketplace possible there you at go. the lowest cost. Really? Yeah. Lowest. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. In other words, there's no, I wouldn't recommend looking around either Mr. Client because it's not going to get any better than that really, you know? So, all right. What else, what, man? Question from Jared. So Jared had a problem with his, profile being rejected in lead connector trust center my reaction to that is make sure your legal business name is on your website and your email ma domain matches your website domain and jared if that is still a problem you can reach out to me and i'll be glad to take a look at that with you but 99 percent of the time that's what causes it killer there's a lot of questions in here that are about kind of the specific steps of that business registration stuff and i just wanted to say i'm going to update our compliance sheet i mean this stuff is high level help docs at this point but i'm going to update our compliance cheat sheet to have a, an exact walkthrough of how to go through that business registration on the lc side including the tips and tricks about having the the name of the business on the on the website and a domain matching the, the business name etc so Hang tight with stuff like that. If you just miss some of the details as Michael is walking through it, that'll be a resource that's made available to you. So we don't, there's like five or six questions about just some of the nitty gritty there. And we'll-, Al we'll Alan we'll, asked, how does the word campaign different, different? how is it different from <laughs> Twilio and GHL? So a, a Twilio campaign or an A2P campaign is just, it's a template submission that you're giving to GHL that's giving it to Twilio that's putting it in the database for carriers and the definition is these are the types of messages that are being sent in a campaign so the best I can do to answer this is kind of if you look at it realistically granny gets a text message and granny doesn't like it and granny reports it to her carrier who's AT&T so AT&T will say ah oh, I see this message is from this number let me trace this number to a campaign which is attached to a brand and a, and a profile. And let's see if this type of message is allowed and what they submitted to us. So if you're, if you say in your low volume mix campaign, you're doing appointment reminders, confirmations, and follow up, and you're sending messages to buy, I don't know, 10 pounds of steak, then it's obvious there's obviously a problem there. So they, they use these campaigns to, validate the types of messages that are going on when, did, when doing a dr blah 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 so this is a dr specific question are we still operating it's hard to read these still operating i think that's one for you we're still operating on the assumption that as long as people have a business relationship or not a cold list we know that that's our ask you obviously we can't provide often to proof if you can't we recommend following up with leads who have opted in to receive marketing from that business for B. If they haven't, then you're at risk. That's what are the con? This is from David. What are the cons of Lead Connector to self managed Twilio? Lead Connector is great. I recommend using it unless you have a need for not using it. And some of the examples I gave earlier are you work with political candidates or 501c3s. Also, any anyone out there that's a either a professional developer, software developer, or someone that just likes to hack. You don't have access to the Twilio. It's just a programmatic platform. So you lose access to the, what, the hooks. And that means nothing to the majority of us. However, you do lose access to customize your own Twilio. I've done that myself, an example of who and how you may want to do it. I get an inbound text message that comes into Twilio and I split it. So I'll send a copy of the message to high level and I'll send a copy of the message to, I use a donation system. 
So both systems receive it and you can't do that in lead connector. Interesting. So, so programmatic, if you wanted to do customizations, you lose that capability. If you're not going to do customizations and you're not doing special use cases like 501c3s, government, so on and so forth, lead connector all the way. No questions there. Which I think is 100% of people on this call. And as a great question, what about the missed call text back? Is it, yeah, what's your take on missed call text back? I would, I mean, to the letter of a carrier law, which isn't really law, is I, I might even have a separate campaign for that. Mm -hmm. or or write it into your campaign description right so when you're submitting your low low volume mix you know can't type this is actually a great idea thanks for asking the question appointment confirmations appointment reminders follow-ups and voice call text bags and that would cover it i guess and Ethan, just to share Rob's perspective or the, the team's perspective, we've never, we've always taken that if somebody calls in, it's appropriate to text them back if the call is missed. We've never had anyone get in any kind of trouble for that. We just try to treat the lead with respect and our goal is to gather the name and see what they're interested in. And it, it, you know, it, 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 always, does, oh, it always does right by the consumer. It's a good way to engage them. We've never had anyone get you know, upset about that in the first place. And so if, as long as you're treating them well and, you know, you're not blowing them up and doing inappropriate things, then, then you know. The biggest risk in the world is not that person that calls you because it's just common practice nowadays. Someone calls and you get a text. Who is this? What do you want? Right? It's just, it's normal. Yeah. The person you got to worry about is granny. Granny that's still paying for her, you know, a hundred texts a month. Yeah. Same question here that was asked earlier. Every sub account should be registered. What if we, the client, it's hard to see this one. What if we, the client. Whose question is it? I'm trying to look around. It's Bjorn. Bjorn. I see one. From... If you can get Bjorn's, I'm going to keep going. I got to be honest. Yeah, yeah, keep going. I'll search around. Yeah, David. Mine start a a new Twilio compliance agency. It's kind of like I lucked in. I didn't luck into it. I was just kind of bestowed upon me the title of GHL compliance dude 18 months ago. When they first started. <laughs> when this all started. Threatening that they were going to start. <laughs> oh, I see Bjorn's now. Bjorn, yes, you can register multiple numbers in GHL. If you have one if you have one in Twilio and another one through LC, I'm not totally sure about that. You might need to work with Go High Level Support. That's a very, very <laughs> narrow Good question. question. You probably have to transfer the number. Very likely you have to transfer the number. Right. Well, yeah. So just transfer it over into the LC system, which you yeah. Can... And and the the transfer process is probably on the LC side. You submit a ticket to High Level, right? right. On the Twilio side, if you're self managed, it's very simple. You need the the SID that it's coming from and the SID that it's going to and permission from the person to release it if it hasn't already been released and they don't want to release it because they don't want it to be, they want to maintain ownership, continu continuous ownership. So a ticket to high level if you're using lead connector, a ticket to Twilio if you're using self-managed Twilio. Do And this is from Mar Marty or Martin. I missed the beginning. Do we have some sort of compliance now for Twilio or else? Yes, the answer is yes. It just, it started to kick in, long story short, it started to kick in roughly end of January. T-Mobile has always been the one with the most aggressive words and they are indeed the ones that are starting to enforce right now. Well, I'm bored, this is from Ganesh. I can't see the whole name, Ganesh, Ganesh, there we go. While I'm boarding the client, do you ask how the phone numbers have been collected? Do they have to consent? I, that's kind of your question, Kaplan. I'm looking around for him. Was it where in relation to? I remember I saw Martins, which you just answered. Yeah, oh, about yeah. when I'm wondering the client, yes, the numbers have been collected. Do they have consent? We always assume that they have because it's, but yeah, if you're worried about that, then yeah, you want to make sure that 
the the list of leads is familiar with that business. Again, we want to do that for results reasons, not not just compliance, but compliance gets thrown in with that. So yeah, it's good to cover the base of how these leads were generated in the first place. Make sure you understand. I would be interested in that for the sake of being able to set good expectations around results. How old is the list? How did most of these leads come through? Yeah, having a good understanding of the makeup of the database is important for results as well as compliance, for sure. And depending on how robust your onboarding or training is, onboarding and or onboarding training is, you may just want to include a, whether you may have a membership video or section, or you just may have documents. But uh, I would recommend a, a simple page that explains to your new clients what their responsibilities are. So you're responsible for your list. You're welcome to use our system. Here are some legal requirements and carrier requirements and just get them up to speed and then have them agree to terms. It's a little checkbox. I agree. And now you're, they're responsible for it. Number one. So you're, you're mitigating your risk. Number two is you're helping educate and inform them as to what they can, can't do, should and shouldn't be doing. Yeah. So we would recommend probably having just an onboarding form like we always did. You're collecting necessary info. It's when they're sending you the, their database anyways, you're just getting kind of the onboarding info situated, have an extra box that's, you know, I agree to this. You could have a link to another page that just says, hey, the way this works is that we only want to send messages out to leads who have opted in to receive marketing from you guys That's and et cetera. So basically what Michael's saying, just integrate that into a basic onboarding form that you guys probably need to have anyways. And the most important question from Trevor he says, I'm in Rochester Hills. Where are you? I'm in Trenton, <laughs> dude. <laughs> I'm on the river in Trenton. Nice. I'm like Sarah Palin. I can look out my window and see, can not Russia, but Canada. What if I'm international, new businesses registered in New Zealand, but I text realtors in the US? Do I need an LLC? That is actually a question for either Sean. So this is once again, Martin Towers. This is a special question. Twilio, I would ask, first of all, are you self-managed or lead connect? If you say I'm self-managed, then when you're creating your business profile in Twilio, there are options for that. And if you're using lead connector, I'm going to guess there's options for that as well. If there, if there isn't, even if there isn't, I would ask Sean or you know high level support. How do I manage that? 18 months ago, that was a problem. People outside the U.S. were kind of not allowed to register. And so then they throw their hands in there and go, well, what am I going to do? What am I like? The, this is going to all come to an end. It's September 2021. Well, it hasn't happened yet, so. mm -hmm. but it is happening. So uh, I would ask. Michael's got a great one below that. I see it. Mike. What, what exactly? It's hard for me to get the entire question position. What is it says, I'm talking with a couple small businesses that use a Gmail email instead of a domain specific email. Will this mm -hmm. prevent them from sending texts? It, it will potentially prevent them from becoming improved. Gotcha. So I had that problem with two clients. So I, I just happened to also kind of manage their domain. So I created them email addresses on the fly. Great. So that's a problem that can be solved. It's uh, yeah. so my, for, for Michael, I would all, you know, for Michael, um, I would also ask, are you using lead connector or self-managed Twilio? It's lead connector, submit a ticket to high level. If it's Twilio, world-class support on the Twilio side, absolutely world-class on the, on the self-managed side, submit a ticket and say, my profile was rejected. My client is using a Gmail, but has a website. This Gmail is clearly on the website. Is this okay? So I would think that if that Gmail address were also on the website, that that would be sufficient too. So there's kind of a trend here almost of folks like, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? And the prescription is, well, first, is it LC or Twilio? But even then, it, the, the main lesson here is that whether it's LC or Twilio, there's fantastic support that are on your side that obviously high level is only going to make money if you make money. So their goal is to make this easy and to support you with trying to get these things pushed through if at all possible. So lean on them, sub submit a ticket, have us expedite your ticket, post in our group, et cetera, as you go through specific little situations, because they're there to be on your team with helping you navigate this stuff. So one of, can you write this down and give it to Rob? Yeah. One of the things I would ask him to ask Sean and the team is, is there any way that a 
agency's client, an agency or an agency's client can get access to that Twilio subaccount. So high level is just front ending everything right now and they're not exposing the back end Twilio crap so that we don't have to deal with it. But if in some of these extreme or intense accounts that have a lot of activity going on, it'd be nice to have access to that Twilio sub account. And if Sean and the team can make that happen, a lot of, pro now you can go straight to Twilio and ask that question. That's why I thought of it. This is a great question. Great. Okay. Scrubbing through to see if there's any other last minute questions here. Is there any way to run your client's list through a DNC registry to make sure no one is on that list? It's a, my best recommendation I have is go out, do an internet search. You'll find companies that do it. It's, it's an expense we all don't want to do. Um, myself, what I've done in the past is I've, I'm historically I've done local marketing. So from the F, CC, each person, each EIN or social security number is allowed to download up to five area codes. And there's a tool where you can do your own DNC scrubbing and it's not for the faint of heart. It's a very complex tool. So you can do your own if, you're, if your um, lists are all within five area codes, you can do your own. But if they're spread across more than five, you know the, the path of least resistance is still probably going out, finding a vendor and doing that. But you got to trust the vendor. Once again, you're responsible for calling. So if you're entrusting a vendor to scrub your list and it's not, and they're using a two-year-old DNC list, you're at risk. So unfortunately, it's an expense that sucks. Yeah. Jose asked, do we need to register for AT&T and Verizon then to be compliant with what Michael said in the beginning? No, these, all these submissions are, they go into one shared database up for all the carriers. Right. Ba, 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 ba. I think some of these are a little more specific too. So I'm trying to make sure we get to the ones that'll be good for the whole group. Let me consistent response. Okay. I think that's most of the general questions that are probably most valuable to the whole group. I'm not sure about Ethan's last question. I have a Twilio. Three or four people asked, what do you recommend? Twilio or LC? Yeah, totally. LC. LC. DNC customers will be identified for that. Okay, so Shark Brothers, if a client's list contains DNC customers, but we're identifying the company and providing explicit instructions instructions to opt out, is that a reliable CYA? No, no you're at risk. You're at risk. Yeah. Right, simple and clear. No, there there, there's, there's fine print here. If you collect that lead and they're on the DNC, you have 90 days. This is basically, it's a 90 day license to call text, whatever you want. But you know, if they opt out during that 90 days, you have to respect their, their wishes. But beyond that 90 day window, you're at risk. So when someone brings to you a list and says, here's my lead list, we send out, we make calls or send, send text messages. Yeah. Um, especially if they're to consumers, be careful. So Bjorn, I'll answer this question because this is, especially for the folks who missed the beginning, up until today, we had never done any brand registration for an any A2P campaign registration for any number sending less than 500 messages a day, which is, you know, as Rob said, if you're even sending more than 200, you probably need to go back to the messaging for results sake instead of ramping up volume. But as Michael explained at the beginning, this is a brand new thing as of the 26th, where even low level, even low volume actors, low volume senders are needing to go through this brand registration stuff. So it's something that as of right now, we're officially recommending that everybody do. Luckily, it's very easy and simple. And so I'm going to provide more explicit instructions in our group moving forward after this about how to go through this and make sure you guys have all the resources necessary. But to ask what's the advantage of registering versus not registering is very different today than it was yesterday. And we recommend that you do it. Yeah, the Shark Brothers just have a quick follow-up. So if you have with the DNC thing, if somebody's on the DNC list, but then they opt in to your campaign. So we have one 90 day shot at a client's list, allowing them to opt out from a campaign. Is that right? Yeah. Not, you have 90 days to communicate with them unless they opt out. If they opt out, you have to respect their wishes. 
and you yeah. should should be able to in a court of law not that this is going to happen once again we're not we're not here to scare anyone but the letter of the law says you have to show proof that 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 person opted in if by chance granny gets pissed off someday when you call her or text her yeah then martin yeah well i'll post these in the in the group in school that's where they'll be yeah that's pretty much it yes even if they're on the I, official i gotta get rolling here haplin but i have a just for anyone that for you and or anyone else, I do testimonial and tip Thursdays, which has been for me the last two months, been predominantly A2P. And it's just 30 minute sessions on Thursday for anyone that wants to jump in. There's no fee. It's testimonial and tip. Jump on. We discuss, look through your screens or compliance. If there's any issues, we fix it. Testimonial was required and a voluntary tip is if someone feels they got value out of it. So if absolutely, not, that's amazing. How can somebody get involved in that or where? Can we post about that? I'll give it a link. Okay. I'll right. give it so to we'll... you in a Facebook message. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So I'll make sure to post that for you guys too. So if you want to interact more with Michael, you know how to do that. And um, yeah, thank you so much for being on with us, Michael. I feel like this was huge for us, huge for me. I learned stuff today, and you know, <laughs> I, I, I able to breathe. You know, take a deep breath. Understand it's okay. There are going to be issues, more and more issues as we get further and further into this, but understanding them, fixing them, and then being ahead of your competition is what ultimately pays off. Yeah, agreed. Well, thanks so much for being here. For folks who don't know where our group is, go to robbailey.com slash group. I just put it in the chat. That's how 99% of people are accessing this call, but we want to make sure that you're a part of our free. It's totally free to join. We just have resources like this available to the public folks who are using high level and wanting to get the most out of it. Thank you all for your patience. There was a lot of folks on the call and a lot of activity in the chat. So if I missed anything, if we miss anything, thanks for your patience there and make sure you post in the group feel free to continue the conversation and again it's not even just low haplin and rob know everything we're obviously sourcing as much of the best wisdom as we can from folks like michael but this is all of us growing together and trying to edify one another to make sure that our campaigns are super compliant and results oriented and that we're all being you know safe and doing things the right way so yeah open up a ticket with high level keep us updated on what you're learning post in the group post your questions your struggles your wins etc and we'll keep journeying together. Thanks again to Michael, and we'll see you guys in the group. Talk to you later. Thanks, dudes and dudettes. Have a good day.